Rod Sterling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. Today, Glenn Hall Taylor's tragedy of murder in a theater. Violence takes a curtain call. Starring Shelley Berman. In the Mutual Broadcasting System presentation of The Zero Hour. skirts of a middle western metropolis lies a city dump. Here and there, shacks, improvised from scrap lumber and other materials, offer dubious shelter to hangers-on of the human race. Today, as we watch, we see a gaunt, ragged man standing atop a rusting oil drum. With tar paper and strips of wood, he's repairing a hole in the roof of his dismal abode. And all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Hey, At you. first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse. Hey, hey, arms. you with the hammer. That's as you like it. Yeah, we could say I liked it. Obviously, you haven't attended the theater a great deal. No, but I got a great deal for you. That is, if you're interested. Deal, sir? You mean you wish to negotiate with me? Well, that's one way of putting it. You see this ten spot? Truly, it's a sight for these old eyes. Though at one time I was quite familiar with the engraved portraits of several famous Americans. At the moment, however, I'll gladly settle for Alexander Hamilton... What role am I to play in return for your beneficence? Uh, what, what do you mean, role? I am a thespian, sir. A professional actor. Barnaby Duke is the name. Oh, hiya, Duke. Just, uh, just call me Tony. The circumstances to which I am temporarily reduced is a sad commentary on the state of our country's dramatic arts. As for television, it is a most undiscerning medium. Would you believe, sir? that the only welcome extended to me was by one of its upstart David Velasco's who expected me to perform in a role which would have been as demeaning as that of a busboy at the Last hey, Supper. Hey, hey, you want to earn some bread? Sir, I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat, get that I wear, owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, glad of other men's good. In short, I'm open to a deal. Okay, the deal is this. I give you the ten spot now, so you'll keep your bright and shinies open for a skinny little dude about five foot six, weighing in at about 110 pounds. He's got a gimp in his left leg and a scar on his left cheek. Now, uh, as soon as I'm sure you've spotted the right guy, I'll top this with a $50 bill. I accept. Five foot six, 110 pounds, left leg lame, and a scar on the left cheek. Right on. <laughs> I always was a quick... Study. Yeah, well, if you ask me, I think you're also nuts. I am but mad north, northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hook from a handsaw. That's from Hamlet. Uh, yeah, 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 I'll take your word for it. Now, here's my phone number, and don't lose it. I'll expect to hear from you. Goodbye, sir. I appreciate your largest. Hey, hey, what do you mean large? My shorts are only 36s. Robbery detail, Captain Hollenbeck. Yes, sir? Oh. When? They did, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Both Sergeant Diego and I are familiar with the case. We'll get right on it. Yes, sir. That was the state penitentiary. George Cook died about half an hour ago. Well, that blows our chance to find out where he stashed all that loot from the last job. Well, not necessarily. George's brother was with him when he tossed in the towel. Well, that may mean something. Gus Cook scrammed out of this town right after his brother was sent out. Yeah, three months ago. If Gus shows up here now, it may mean George tipped him off to the hiding place. Something tells me my home life's going to be shot again until we track him down. This is a big city. Yeah, yeah. It's 
It's me, Frankie. Tony. Hey, Tony. What's the latest? Yeah, well, I, uh, I spread a few green ones among half a dozen bums who got pads around the city dump. Gave him a description of Cook's brother. Does so Gus Cook look anything like his brother? Uh, sort of. George was a big guy, but Gus is only a little... Well, he's only a little over five feet. If you saw them together, though, you'd figure they could be brothers. That's how come my connection up in the slammer passed the word through the outside. George was dying, and when Gus paid him a visit up there, the little guy looked so much like George, the connection figured him for the brother. The connection heard George tell Gus the loot's buried at the city dump. The dump's a big place. Uh, that's why I want to tail Gus if he shows up there. If he snoops around and one of those bums reports him to us, he could lead us right to the payoff. Sounds good. I'll get it. Hello? This is Barnaby Duke calling. There's just a second. It's some guy who talks like he's holding out his pinky. Says he's some kind of a duke. Hey, Barnaby Duke. Good. Give me the phone. Hello, Duke. This is Tony. While strolling about my domain this afternoon, I was certain I spotted your man. He strolled about a bit, kicking here and kicking there, then left. Uh huh. Well, where did he spend most of his time? I would say within 50 feet or so of my modest abode. Thanks, old timer. I'll check him out later. If it's the dude I'm looking for, I owe you 50. The city enjoyed delightful weather today with clear sunny skies and a high of 73. Tonight will also be clear with the predicted low of 58. Barkeep, draw me a flagon of your finest amber brew. By the looks of those threads you're wearing, you must expect someone to pay for it. Who? A valid question, but unnecessary. This, sir, is United States currency recently tendered me for services rendered. It will more than suffice, I am sure. Today he died. This picture, taken at the time of Cook's trial, shows him entering the courthouse with his police escort and his brother Gus. Gus Cook That's was not under indictment. Wait, Wait fellow. Never mind. It's nothing. Barkeep, don't draw the beer until I return. I have a most important telephone message to transmit. The gate is testimony. State penitentiary authorities reveal Gus Cook had visited his brother shortly detail, Captain Hollenbeck. Good evening, Captain. My name is Barnaby Duke. I've been watching the TV news. The station just showed a photograph of the convict, George Cook, and his brother, Gus. Yes, sir. I thought you might be interested to know Gus Cook is the man I saw wandering about my neighborhood. Therefore, my good Captain, it struck me that it might be more than coincidence that Mr. Gus Cook was back in our fair city so soon after visiting his brother. Yes, sir. Thank you. Maybe worth looking into. Now, your name, name again? Barnaby Duke. Where can you be reached? I guess our hunch was right. Some guy on the phone said he'd seen Gus Cook wandering around town. Where around town? That's what I didn't get a chance to find out. When I asked for his address, he hung up. I'd like to see that guy in person and find out how much he really knows. Mm -hmm. finding our way through all this crud and junk in the dark. I wish I could use the flashlight. Well, maybe later. Darn those bottles. I told you it'd be tough going. I can't even see far enough ahead to... Oh. Shh, 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 shh. Hey, hey, hey. Hold it. Hold it. Look up ahead there. Someone's digging. It's Gus. Just as I figured, he led us right to it. We're gonna take him? No, 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 no. Let him bring it up for us first. There. He's got it. It's a flight bag. 
Let's move in. Hello, Gus. Who are you? Turn the flashlight on us, Frankie. Let him see. Yo, my you dirty... Yeah, this is some husky flash. The light didn't even go out. Yeah, swing the beam this way. Let, let's see what's in the bag. Bingo, this is it, all right. Oh, some whore. No wonder Georgie wasn't going to let no one know where he'd stashed it. Who's there? Now the light. I know you're there, gentlemen. Who are you? It's that two-bit hand that called me about Gus. Hiya, Duke. Oh, it's you. You gave me quite a start. I was in my tar paper Taj Mahal on the verge of slumber when I heard you out here. And, uh, what's this? What's this? Sook's a man. His head's laid wide open. It's your friend. It's Gus Cook. You who murdered We can't leave him here. The cops will swarm around like flies. I had a plan for Gus. There's no reason it won't work for two as well as one. What'll work? Making it look like an accident. Gus's car is parked just ahead of ours back there on the road. Let's get him into it. You drive and I'll follow you. We'll push him off the cliff at the hairpin curve. Oh, and uh, Frisk Duke. He may have that slip of paper with my phone number. Get it back. <laughs> I gotta go so fast, Greg. Because we want to get there before the old guy dies. The highway patrol says the driver of the car's already dead, Gus. And this other guy had some old theatrical clippings in his pocket. His name's Barnaby Duke. That's the guy that called about Gus. He was brought in last night. I didn't think he'd make it. But he's a stubborn old mule. You can talk with him, but, but please don't make it too long. Thanks, Doc. Mr. Duke, how'd you happen to be riding in a car with Gus Cook? It was most certainly not of my choosing. The last thing I remember was looking down at his body and talking to two men. One of them was the man who'd given me the $10 bill to let him know if Mr. Cook showed up. The other man conked me with a flashlight, I think. Did you recognize the other man? No. Between the flashlight in my eyes and the darkness, it was like standing in a spotlight in a darkened auditorium. Oh, to hear the applause and to smell the grease paint once more. <laughs> it still hurts. Tell me, do you still have that piece of paper the fella called Tony gave you? You know, the one with the phone number on it? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, you don't remember it, do you? Gadzooks, man. My head even hurts when I try to remember who I am. Okay. For now, we're going to keep you in this private room until you're well enough to make it on your own. We're going to let the killers believe you're as dead as Gus Cook. If they think the witnesses are out of the way, they might get careless. I hope you feel better, and thanks for helping. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Duke. <laughs> the niceties of a private room. This Tony. Yeah. Yeah, this is Tony. Who's this? This is Barnaby Duke. It didn't do you any good to steal the paper with your phone number on it. I told you I was a quick study. You're alive. Very much so. I thought perhaps you'd be so kind as to deliver my fifty dollars to room seven oh seven Doctor's Hospital. Why, uh, of course. I'd be delighted. Frankie and I'll be right over. I thought you'd like to see me again. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, old-timer. I'll hurry. Believe me. Don't drive any faster. All we have to do to blow this chance is to get picked up for traffic violation. Don't worry. Hey, I know how we can get in to see him, even if the fuzz is watching. I've been in that hospital before. There's a parking lot near the emergency entrance. Inside the door, there's a desk and a couple of those white coat guys in a wheelchair at... There's two of them in there. Get your gun out. You take one, I'll take the other. Okay. Up with them, you bum. Hey, what's going on? What is it? Shut up. 
Get in that storage closet and get those uniforms off. Captain Hollenbeck, please. Hurry. Barnaby Duke here, sir. I called our friend Tony. He's on his way over here right now. I suggest you hurry. Thank you very much. Where are you two of interns going with that wheelchair? It's an emergency. There he is. Hey, let's get out of here. These must be their car. Well, we know it's not that sport job or that convertible. Or that limousine with a guy in a monkey suit. We all set? Everything's covered. Staircases, elevators, all entrances, exits. Get down. Here they come. Freeze! Duke, you fool. Suppose we hadn't made it in time. Even stuffing pillows under the bedclothes might not have worked. Why, just set yourself up like that. First, they're killers. Second, that dastardly Tony owes me $50. And third... Third? It was a scene I'd always wanted to play. Oh, it was beautiful right out of the harem sequence in the Arabian Nights. I was hiding in the nurse's lounge. I'm Rod Serling. Close your eyes, exercise your imagination, and join us again on our next presentation of The Zero Hour. Violence Takes a Curtain Call is an original radio drama adapted by Glenn Hall Taylor. Shelley Berman was heard as Barnaby Duke. Featured in the cast were Jacques Denbo, Dick Ryle, Ben Wright, Scott Ellsworth, and Barney Phillips. Zero Hour, created by J.M. Coates. Directed by Don Hills, is produced in Hollywood by the Mutual Broadcasting System by Radio Productions Incorporated. Music is composed and conducted by Stanley D. Hoffman, Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. This has been a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System.